Thank you, everybody, and welcome to this week's, week's SOAS Department of Development Studies in Bloomsbury DTC for the Social Sciences Seminar. We're delighted this evening to welcome tonight's speakers, Liam Campling and Alejandro Colas, to SOAS for a presentation entitled Capitalism in the Sea, Sovereignty, Territory and Accumulation in the Global Ocean. Liam teaches political economy at Queen Mary University of London, where he's the director of the Centre on Labour and Global Production. He's an editor of the Journal of Agrarian Change and has published widely on global production, international trade and the po political economy of development and the environment. He's currently working on a monograph, appropriately enough, entitled Capitalism and the Sea. Alejandro is a reader in international relations at Birkbeck College, University of London, where he also directs two of their MSc programs. He's author of the book Empires and a co-editor of a volume entitled Mercenaries, Bandits and Empires, Private, Political, Private Violence in Historical Context. His work on topics including imperialism, internationalism and global governance has appeared in leading journals such as Development and Change, International Affairs and Millennium and he's a member of the Isaac and Tamara Deutsche Memorial Prize Committee. Also joining us this evening is Juan Grigera. Juan is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the UCL Institute for the Americas, a member of the editorial board of Historical Materialism and co-convener of the London Latin American Marxist Reading Group. Juan will act as discussant tonight, offering his reflections after Alex and Liam present. The hashtags, if you want to tweet, are SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. And I think I'll hand over to you both now, if you want to. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Faisy and uh, Alfredo, Juan and Joe, uh, for the opportunity to introduce or present um, a work in progress. Um, Liam and I are working on a book called Capitalism and the Scene. And this is really our first proper outing in terms of how far we've got. Um, we, we've embarked in this, uh, in this project um, about 18 months ago, two years. By the way, maritime punnery comes in waves, so forgive us if, uh, if there's an excess of that. We've been working on this for, for about 18 months, two years, as a specific project. Um, and today what we want to try and do is, in um, quite an ambitious way, I suppose, given the time, uh, try and condense some of, the, some of the ideas. So we want to consider um, how... A social form like capitalism relates to a natural force uh, like the sea. And we assume that both of, both of these are historical entities. They're changing entities. Uh, they relate unequally. Um, that is, uh, there is no mechanical or uh, automatic direct reciprocity. Um, and that these two entities, one social, the other natural, um, have different temporalities as well. Clearly the sea is, um, I was going to say, as old as the hills, but Liam reminded me that it's older than the hills. And capitalism, on our account, is no more than about 500 years old. But uh, the relationship between these two entities um, has arguably accelerated in the past few uh, decades, or arguably a uh, century and a half. For the first time, the human race is able to change the physical geography of the oceans through acidification and global warming. And the sea itself has facilitated the speeding up of capitalist circuit, of the capitalist circuit. So we want to make two main arguments. Um, one, that the sea is a site and a source of competitive innovation and experimentation by capital. In part, and this is important for our story, because of the biophysical properties of the sea and the obstacles that the sea, the oceans, present for the reproduction of capitalism. Um, the second argument is that the responses to these challenges um, of expanded reproduction through and at the sea have historically produced what we uh, have called a, a terraceous space, and we'll try and illustrate that as we go along, uh, borrowing that phrase from uh, Herman Melville and, I suppose, other formulations. Um, but clearly we're informed by the whole tradition of Lefebvrean and Harvey-esque uh, production of space ideas, um, including uh, the production of spaces of solidarity and contestation, uh, political and otherwise. The sea has operated as a frontier of capitalism. It's been a surface through which new markets are prized open, um, it's a rich source of energy, of protein, uh, of monetized leisure. 
It's a critical theater of inter-imperial rivalry, uh, of military domination and world hegemony. It has also been a site of both the vilest forms of human oppression, um, such as the slave ship, but a conduit of emancipatory transformations, both individual and collective, not least through forms of internationalism. For capital, the sea, therefore, is both a risk and an opportunity. Um, although mercantile and later properly liberal tropes celebrate the sea as a realm of freedom, of navigation, uh, freedom of trade, of scientific inquiry, of cultural exchange, uh, of universal law and social mobility, words, for instance, like flotation, liquidity, flows, ventures, invoke all the kind of movement and the prospect that the sea offers. In fact, in more recent neoliberal formulations, the sea almost becomes a, a libertarian utopia, um, a non-place beyond the state, regulation, taxes, class antagonisms, and war, uh, the kind of place that Richard Branson uh, likes to live in. Um, it is presented as sheer surface, a flat, frictionless horizon of opportunity. We think this is uh, pure fantasy in the strictest ideological sense. Uh, the sea has acted, on our account, as a laboratory for novel forms of violence, of exploitation, oppression, and appropriation. Since its very origins, capitalism has sought to transcend the land-sea divide, or the distinction, trying to integrate the various circuits or the various elements in the circuit of capital, commodity, productive, and money capital, into a totality that reconciles the terraceous nature of our world, the fact that the world is made up of both earth and water. But this push to go beyond the biophysical properties of water and earth has in turn produced on our account very peculiar spatial forms, three of which we're going to focus on in the remainder of the paper. One is the exclusive economic zone. The second is the uh, open register ship or the flag of convenience. We'll use that as a shorthand. And finally, um, what I've called, or what we've called, counter-piracy high-risk areas. And we want to focus on, on each of these spaces. And our overall argument, then, is that each of these spaces, specifically where land meets sea, they, we've chosen them partly because they represent that uh, liminal space, if you like, um, highlight certain experimental dynamics in capitalist development and its particular relationship to the global ocean. So specifically, the EEZ underlines the innovation in capitalist appropriation of marine resources. Uh, the flag of convenience represents or crystallizes uh, a space for the exploitation of labor. And the multilateral counter piracy uh, initiatives represent uh, an attempt at maritime governance uh, of capitalist circulation. So you can see we're going to use a uh, a collection of concepts that are not perfectly or mechanically aligned. But um, our argument or our, our proposition is that these moments are all fleeting uh, moments in the constant metamorphosis of capitalism, but they could be seen for purposes of presentation as sort of snapshots, as stills in that circulation, that, that reproduction of, of capital, um, as, as, as places where commodity, productive, and money capital are respectively reproduced. Uh, so, as I say, we're trying to articulate both spatial metaphors and um, uh, metaphors or, or realities of mobility. These are not mechanical or static uh, correlations. We, we want to emphasize that. Um, as all of these Thoracic spaces, the EZ, the flag of convenience ship, and piratical area combine different and distinctive expressions of sovereignty, territory, uh, territory, and appropriation. But for the purposes of our presentation, it might be said that the EZ represents a specifically capitalist form of appropriation. So we're going to highlight that aspect in the, in the circulation of, of capital. The flag of convenience as a, a domain of sovereignty and the piratical waters, piratical waters as a domain of territory. In short, what we're kind of doing, we're trying to do, is answer three types of questions. One is, who owns the fish? Uh, how is exploitation organized at sea? And where does authority lie on the oceans? And so we're going to box and cox uh, with Liam taking over this first question of who owns the fish, and then I'll pick up the... So, first of all, who owns the fish? 
Social property relations over, over fisheries have a very long history, extending well before the emergence of capitalism. For example, a system of marine tenure in uh, feudal Sicily shaped access to bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean. But for around 400 years until the mid-20th century, the sea outside of a cannon shot from the coast around three nautical miles was considered as rex nullis, or nobody's property, and thus open to assumed limitless exploitation or extraction of fish. So I'm going to sketch two kind of moments of experimentation in terms of access to and in turn ownership over marine fish populations, one in the late 1940s and another in the 1980s both centred on US state power, and both represent a sea change in the doctrine of who owns the fish. So after World War II, the United States was faced with a conundrum. On the one hand, how to stop the fishing capital of the rapidly reindustrializing Japan from returning to fish for salmon off the coast of the US, off the US West Coast, where it had been dominant in the 1930s. And on the other hand, simultaneously export support the expansion of the US tuna fleet into new commodity frontiers in the Pacific Ocean, in other words, into other countries' waters. So why did this matter to the US state and capital? Well, first of all, there was a sizable canning industry in the US since the 1800s. Canning plants were established across um, the mouths of rivers uh, throughout the entire length of the Pacific coast of North America. They were there to process salmon caught on their return to spawn in rivers after two years of living in oceans. Their butchered bodies fed the salmon canneries, which in turn provided nutrition to the growing American working class. If Japanese boats caught the salmon before they could return to spawn, it would mean the end of raw material supplies to this industry. On the flip side, San Diego's tuna canneries started out in 1903 by catching, catching relatively close to the US. But buoyed by heavy subsidies from the US state, the industry began to grow, and new fishing grounds were needed. Tuna are a highly migratory species in the sense that the populations swim great distances, traversing human-drawn borders in the oceans. Tuna populations off the Pacific coast of Latin America, and crucially in the central Pacific Ocean, where the US Navy was planning a series of post-war bases, um, were central to the kind of US uh, industry's development. As the US Secretary of State of the Interior stated in 1947, quote, tuna is a magic word in any community or country which looks to the sea for food and profits. <laughs> the solution of the US state to the conundrum of simultaneously protecting its salmon populations and supporting the expansion of its tuna industry into other countries' waters continues to shape the global governance of the oceans to this day. In 1945, President Truman famously and unilaterally proclaimed US sovereignty over the continental shelf, motivated primarily by control over access to oil and other mineral resources in the seabed and subsoil. Less well known is that on the same day, he also unilaterally, unilaterally proclaimed the United States' right to establish fishery conservation zones in the high seas contiguous to the US coast. This specified that where a fishery was developed by Americans, it would be universally managed by the US state in the interests of conservation. Quick uh, parenthesis here, the exclusive economic zone didn't exist at this point in time. So this war fish in this water belonged to nobody. Right? So the Americans unilaterally declared that it belonged to them. So while on the one hand, the US state was promoting trade liberalization through things like the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, on the other hand, it was establishing new regimes of protection of access to what it saw as its raw materials. But how and why to specify where and when conservation is actually needed? This all came together with a scientific concept, and by scientific I'm using scare quotes there, which was actually much more a contradictory product of economic nationalism and free market ideology than having any basis in fisheries science. You may have heard of this uh, concept of maximum sustainable yield. Essentially, it was developed by the US State Department to justify its uh, protection of its salmon stocks while allowing its fleet to uh, expand internationally. 
So this, this concept of maximum sustainable yield, and there's a kind of figure here, the original kind of uh, drawing for it, became the cornerstone of international fisheries management bodies in the 1950s and today it's still the dominant way that fisheries are managed. Essentially, it was implemented as a tool to avoid restrictions on fishing unless there was a scientific proof that stocks were overfished, proofs that were then very hard to ascertain. Maximum sustainable yield thereby provided a basis for the US fleet to expand into waters across the Pacific, despite objections from coastal states. The idea being that if the fish wasn't caught according to this concept of MSY, it was waste. So in short, the US restricted fishing on its salmon, but made ownership of tuna nobody's property, at least until it was extracted by fishing capital and then it becomes the ownership owned, owned by that boat. So what the US did here was develop the concept of maximum sustainable yield, which can change the, the conditions of access. It was deployed as a contrary, contradictory mechanism of inclusion and exclusion in the ocean, and it would serve the US tuna industry very well, thank you, at least until the 1980s, to which I now turn. Now, by the mid-1970s, I should note, the exclusive economic zone, which you can uh, see here, is the kind of network of exclusive economic zones, had been accepted in customary international law. This gave states sovereign rights over access to marine resources in up to 200 nautical miles of ocean from their coastlines. In other words, where the fish are in their waters, they are owned by the state. This was negotiated crucially in the world historical context of the third worldist call for a new international economic order in this entire kind of era of the 1970s and so on. And the EZ acted as a form of state landed property, allowing developing country governments to capture ground rent from the fishing activities. But not so for the US fleet. The US state bluntly rejected the idea of the EZ and used its due economic and political power to contest coastal states' efforts to regulate US boats fishing. In particular, the US refused to accept that highly migratory species like tuna could be anybody's property, and it encouraged its distant water fleet to fish in coastal waters with impunity. Cash-strapped newly independent Pacific Island countries, you can see them here, the network of EEZs that they have, relied on the ground rent from uh, tuna access as crucial government revenue. In response to what it saw as the illegal capture of its resources, in the mid-1980s, the Solomon Islands apprehended US vessels fishing without paying ground rent. But this did little to deter the US fleet because the US government reimbursed all of the expenses incurred by what it saw as the illegal seizures of US vessels. Further, the value of this penalty was subtracted from foreign aid to the Solomon Islands. Um, there you are. <laughs> Yet yeah, it was precisely the bipolar power politics of the Second Cold War that the Pacific Islands would leverage. The island nation of Kiribati began negotiating a fisheries access deal with the USSR, and the United States jumped. Rather than allow the Soviet Union a foothold in the Central Pacific, the US, the US set up a multilateral access agreement with all 14 Pacific Island countries, which you can see here, which for a long time was among the most comparatively kind of generous of all tuna access deals. So with a population of only 60,000 people, Kiribati's brinkmanship had transformed the US state's recognition of property in the oceans. What this story of fisheries access shows is the centrality of geoeconomics and geopolitics in answering the vexed question of who owns the fish. The politics of inclusion and exclusion that comes to the fore in these historical moments illustrate that maximum sustainable yield and the EEZ were conceived principally of zones of property rights and therefore rent appropriation rather than areas of sovereign jurisdiction and thus of law enforcement. So, to move to a completely different register. Now I'm going to talk briefly about labour regimes on what I'm calling the total institution of the boat. The question here is, how is exploitation organised at sea? Now, of course, it's impossible to do justice to the diversity of labour regimes on boats on under historical capitalism, and at first sight, it might even appear that there are few differences from working lives on boats in pre-capitalist eras, you know, a boat's a boat. The following is intended as a kind of taster on the, peculiar, the peculiarities of the capitalist exploitation of labour at sea. And I'm going to sketch just some very quick historical moments in different periods in time. So turnaround time is a central structuring dynamic in the merchant navy. 
especially given the high rate of depreciation of boats caused by the eroding power of brine, wind and waves. For commercial capital, a measure of the productivity of labour power on boats is the number of crew per gross tonne of ship, i.e. the volume of stuff moved per employee. Now, there was considerable variation in average labour productivity between the fleets of northern and southern Europe through the 1700s. The northern European fleet averaged around 15 tonnes per person, and the southern European fleet averaged around 5 tonnes per person. The vessels of the English and Dutch East India companies were the tip of the spear of commercial capitalism, driven by competition between capitals to maximise productivity and turnaround time, while the southern European vessels were throwbacks to an area of late feudal and by Iberian plunder. But the Dutch United Provinces in England responded to maritime labour shortages in very different ways. The Dutch Merchant Navy was generally quite cosmopolitan in character, Rapid capitalist development meant a general labour shortage, and the share of foreigners in Dutch maritime employment grew from around 15% of the total in 1600 to over 50% of the total in the late 1780s, by which time there was a peak of around 60,000 people directly employed in the maritime industries. Despite this rapid peak in maritime employment, the Dutch state rarely sponsored forced maritime labour. In contrast, impressment was used widely in Britain to deal with labour maritime shortages. Low stagnant wages and hard, isolated and often deadly work saw the British state depend on the impress service as a major supplier of forced labour to the Navy. Between 1775 and 1883, over 110,000 men were procured. The British state also regulated the nationality of crew. It was even recognised as vital by Adam Smith who defended the mercantilist policy of giving the sailors, quote, the sailors and shipping of Great Britain, the monopoly of the, of the trade of their own country, as necessary for the defence of the country. So along with the Corn Laws, the Navigation Acts of the mid-1600s were amongst the most prominent legal pillars popping up Britain's mercantilist empire. In part, they were designed to limit South Asian seafarers working on boats in the Atlantic, where three quarters of the crew were legislated to be British. Despite this legislation, in the long-distance colonial trades, which were dominated by East India company ships, foreign crew were widely recruited. And in intra-regional trade, in Asia, a majority were non-European, although very often the captains and the owners were Europeans. Now this shifted, and I'm jumping again 200 more years, sorry, but this shifted with the 1849 repeal of the Navigation Acts, which suddenly saw around 20% of crews on British boats being non-British by the 1890s. South Asian seafarers, derogatorily referred to as the Lascars, uh, were, the, were the lowest paid. They were paid about one-sixth of British uh, nationals' wages. Their working conditions the worst, their provisions the poorest quality, and their working hours the longest, despite the fact that they were working directly alongside British seafarers. Unsurprisingly, British ship-owning capital took full advantage of this heightened rate of exploitation and cost reduction, and by the 1920s employed around 50,000 Indian seafarers. Multinational crews were used to deal with labour shortages, but also used as a disciplinary mechanism. Resistance to harsh maritime labour regimes took varied forms. Mutiny was perhaps the ultimate expression of this, but even here there is a wide variety of variation as to the causes, from simple opposition to low pay and despotic captains, through to politically motivated acts linked to rebellions on shore, such as Ireland, there's a lot of Irish crew on British boats. So, but despite this, despite some important strikes in the 1870s, uh, so for example, refusals to work on boats called death ships, boats that were known to be uh, likely to sink, very often for insurance purposes, where those crew were after actually put into prison as a result. Around 1,500 sailors in, in the 1870s were put into prison for, avoiding, for refusing to work on death ships. But it was not until the, 18, the late 1880s that mass unionism emerged in Britain's maritime industries. Crucial moments of seafarer militant, militancy peppered the wider working class and anti-colonial movements, uh, such as the 1889 Docker strike, and again as, the, as part of the syndicalist movement in 1911 and 1912, where, to quote, at one time or another, every port on the UK was on strike and violence was at its greatest. Solidarity amongst seafarers, dockers and stevedores proved to be a winning strategy. 
Despite this active transoceanic organization among maritime workers from the 1880s onwards, it was often racially framed and pitched in politically reactionary terms. In the US, for example, membership of the International Organization of Masters, Mates, and Pilots of America was restricted to, quote, any white person of good moral character, in sound health, and a firm believer in God. In Britain, the National Union of Seamen supported a 1935 government subsody to tramp shipping that was available only to boats with British crews, thereby excluding Indian and other colonial subjects. This reactionary white unionism can be counterpointed with the harnessing by black seafarers of the internationalist potential of their working lives, and very often in solidarity with other left-leaning seafarers groups. While black seafarers were actively discriminated against by elements of white unionism and the British state, they used their mobility to limp, link up struggles in Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe, which were integral to the production and reproduction of communist-inflected black internationalisms, including the coordination of strikes in British West Africa during the, 19, sorry, during the World War II. Growing internationalism and the radicalization of seafarers was often translated into new maritime labor law when this, the state responded to this uh, upsurge. However, capital quickly responded with a new innovation to the resistance and reworking of labor law, the flag of convenience. Uh, I'm just going to show a kind of random picture here. The, one of my favorite photographs that I've taken is a Chinese boat flying a Fiji flag with a very nice boat name, More Rich. A characteristic of the flag of convenience is the ability of ship owners to buy a sovereign and thus the legal jurisdiction that regulates their activities. In doing so, ship owners produce territory as an accumulation strategy. Quick potted history, the legal innovation of the modern flag of convenience originated in Panama, designed in the 1920s to short circuit new US law on seafarers' rights and prohibition on alcohol, Panama gave legal and illicit US enterprises the ability to re register vessels under its flag in return for a small fee. So the Panama Papers is not the first time that Panama's popped into the news around issues like this. As Leon Fink puts it in his book, Sweatshops at Sea, for seafarers, flags of convenience were, to quote, a stunningly unique economic phenomenon. In one sweep of a pen, an entire ship's labor force could be transferred overnight to the, to the jurisdiction and sovereignty of a new national master. Flagging out was ratcheted up during the global stagflation of the 1970s in the frantic hunt for improved profitability amongst the boat owners. There was a general crisis of overcapacity in shipping then. By 2014, the owners of well over 70% of tonnage of the world fleet chose to use flags other than their own, mainly flags of convenience. Ship owners use flag of convenience to cut crew costs, to undermine the self-organization of labor, to minimize tax bills, and to reduce labor regulation. As a result, fishers and seafarers started and ended the 20th century working in the world's most dangerous jobs. Fishers and seafarers fall easily between the cracks of regulatory jurisdiction. Flag state, port state, vessel owner, crew agency, national waters, high seas, all of these intermingle to create complexity. Given this jurisdictional complexity of maritime labor regimes, seafaring is also one of the first examples of international labor regulation, which goes all the way back to kind of medieval and even ancient Rhodian law, which I'm not going to go into here. In more contemporary terms, it has more occupation-specific regulation at the International Labor Organization than for any other job. But despite this, it is organized labor, not states, that has part blocked the anti-labor tide of the flag of convenience. The flag of convenience is not an automatic or smooth strategy for capitalist accumulation. For example, it's contested by the International Transport Workers Federation flag of convenience campaign, which relies on secondary action by port workers in solidarity with the crew on flag of convenience boats. So the proportion of flag, flag of convenience ships with um, agreements with the ITF, International Transport Workers Federation, grew from less than 8% in 1990 to over 30% in 2000, although that's declined in recent years with the reduced industrial muscle of dockers. And on which note, I will move over to Alex, who will talk about piracy. So thus far, as Liam's been suggesting, the 
exclusive economic zone is an innovation in forms of appropriation premised uh, very much around law and certain conceptions of the separation between a jurisdiction and property rights. Um, it produces a space, a distinctive space, which is the 200 nautical miles. The ship, the factory ship, that figure, which of course uh, has varied throughout history and place, but is also a sort of immutable, mobile, um, a, a moving entity that on the one hand represents the movement of capital, circulation of capital, but as Liam has just been describing through history and in very contested forms has also been uh, a domain of deep hierarchies, of, of, of the most static forms of hierarchy regimentation. Uh, it is therefore also a space produced um, by a terraceous space that actually never quite leaves land. I want to uh, finish the set of illustrations, and they are uh, exactly this, illustrations or stories, uh, with reference to contemporary counter-piracy and piracy off the coast of Somalia. As most of you will know, um, around 2007-2008, the waters off that part of, of the Horn of Africa became, um, there was a, a sharp increase in incidents, reported incidents of, of piracy. And this presents a problem of capital in at least three ways. One is a problem of blockage of circulation. Um, it generates all kinds of um, delays and there are, there are profit margins at play, especially in, in and around a place like the Suez Canal. Secondly, it raises the thorny jurisdictional issue of the figure of the pirate. What do we do with pirates um, who were captured at sea, in the high seas, in international waters? And there is a response, which is the, uh, the response of universal jurisdiction. But nonetheless, um, as I'll try and illustrate in a minute, there's, there's a, often a problem for those that capture uh, alleged pirates of processing them for criminal activities. And thirdly, there is uh, a problem around governance, that the sea, be it off the coast of Somalia or, or in many other parts of the world, although that region, um, I think, had its fair share of the following, of, of being a sort of pathology for all kinds of waste, toxic waste, uh, out, of, out at sea, if you like, an out of mind kind of attitude. So it's in that context where I uh, want to refer to another map. Um, or a, a map with a series of zones, perhaps the preferred spatial form of, uh, of the terraceous idea of capital. And these uh, were zones that were created, literally, in August 2011, when a group of maritime industry organizations, uh, including the International Chamber of Shipping, as well as the ITF, which uh, Liam has mentioned, issued a, a series of guidelines uh, entitled Best Management Practices for the Protection uh, Against Somali-Based Piracy, BMP4 otherwise. And this is a, a, a representation of the kinds of spaces that were generated there, a high-risk area in the Gulf of Aden, uh, an internationally recommended transit corridor, um, an extended risk area. All of these um, new spaces were furthermore regulated by novel forms of, or uh, yeah, novel forms of governance, multilateral hybrid that is combining military civilian, um, involving public private partnerships, and they furthermore recharged uh, locations that have recolonized locations in a way that have a historical legacy. Places like Dubai, Djibouti, Seychelles became the centers, the operational uh, headquarters of various counter piracy um, initiatives. So, what we have here is a form of um, explicit territorialization. Um, and these efforts at territorializing stations of the ocean create new valorizations of risk that bind land and sea in very peculiar ways. The incidence of piracy increases the risk and therefore the costs, labor, insurance, fuel, of transit across the Gulf of Aden. As it happens, uh, just uh, in December last year, this uh, was the, the, the high-risk area was revised, again, by a, a, a body of fundamentally private shipping concerns uh, and reduced. 
Um, but I guess what we're especially interested in here is that the mapping of the high-risk areas in their various forms has direct implications for the terms and conditions of seafarers working on vessels in those areas. So once again, multilateral stakeholder governance style um, initiatives are experimented in the terraceous context of the um, of, of the coast of Somalia with an international bargaining forum, uh, the union employer negotiating body for maritime industry, agreeing a series of bonuses, of compensation packages, of rights uh, to refuse sailing within those designated areas. Now, none of these of, uh, of these phenomena, remote control and command, the friction of weather patterns, uh, increased premiums, are necessarily unique to the high seas. But what we do want to suggest is that they are distinctive uh, as the scale and the fluidity of the ocean space precludes the traditional terrestrial response to this predicament, and that is occupation. One of the major challenges for uh, capital is that the sea cannot be occupied, or not permanently at least. And so these multilateral governance initiatives that I've been referring to um, make the sea safe for commodity circulation, but they have to battle with the challenge of enforcing a monopoly over the means of violence in these high-risk areas. Um, and so what we have is an attempt once more at transcending the sea-land divide in the same way that the open registry is an attempt at um, bringing in land-based uh, regimes of labor on the ship and the way that the exclusive economic zone is a way of attempting at appropriating resources of the sea um, the pacification of maritime zones um, is an instance of trying to bridge this, this gap, uh, in turn generating the new spatial configurations, which in many respects reinforce the duality of land and sea. Um, so counterpiracy takes on the multilateral character at sea, but its regional states and their offshore sorry, their onshore coastal facilities that acquire a geopolitical role, Seychelles, Dubai, Djibouti, are recharged uh, with that role of being centres for the patrolling and, uh, and surveillance of the ocean space. Um, again, regional states and their onshore uh, facilities acquire this geopolitical role. Uh, Furthermore, the free seas become increasingly regulated, but they're regulated by land-based regimes of risk uh, through insurance premiums, uh, special employment terms, and so on and so forth. Seeing these kinds of uh, expressions of governance and the Indian Ocean, once again, the Western Indian Ocean has become a sort of laboratory for uh, in experimenting with these forms of governance. Seeing these through the longer duration uh, in history helps us to understand the unique spatial temporal relationships that we're trying to underline between capitalism and the sea. Because the notions of risk and profit, and indeed their complex geographical interconnection, are obviously not new to this region, nor is piracy. Um, in fact, if we start closer from home and uh, hone in on a couple of institutions, the City of London, or more, even more appropriately, Lloyd's insurers, um, we emphasize the continuing primacy of this city as a center of, uh, of not just global finance and insurance, but of production of spaces uh, overseas. Interestingly, both, uh, some of you will know, both these uh, institutions, the city uh, of London and Lloyd's, had origins in coffee houses, which in the course of the 17th century attracted um, stockbrokers, merchants, jobbers uh, in, in Exchange Alley. Um, so, those parts of, of London around Cornhill and, uh, and around that area become the venues, the actual locations for exchange in stocks and shares and market information. And of course, uh, they act as locales for trading in commodities, including coffee from places like um, uh, Mocha or um, of, of um, what is now Ethiopia, Eritrea. So on our account, they incorporate the circulation of money, commodity, and productive capital into a single fixed location, interlacing the city activity with wider maritime networks, trading not just in coffee, but also in spices, in silk, in precious metals, and of course in human beings as well. And 
Furthermore, that linked London at that early stage in the 17th century to wider circuits of trade and commodity exchange, and indeed credit, reaching out into the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and beyond into the Indian Ocean. Um, and I want to just dwell briefly on three kinds of institutions central to the reproduction of capital, particularly of money and commodity capital, which are the product of the maritime factor, as we've called it, uh, the joint stock company, uh, the foreign exchange bill, and the insurance market. Both maritime and terrestrial traffic generated diasporic uh, merchant communities, but it's arguably coastal entrepôts that acted in the long 16th century as the key nodes for the process of differential accumulation. Um, the Northern European 16th century joint stock company is one critical institution. It adopted some of the Mediterranean forms, the so-called Maona from Arabic of Mauna, uh, for mutual aid and assistance, and the Latinate form, the Comenda contract, which underwrote commercial activity of the Italian republics. Um, so here we have the phenomenon of shared risk of stakeholders, uh, of uh, a unified m m management of these companies run by shareholders. The Foreign Exchange Bill is um, another expression of this maritime factor in the burgeoning financial centres of Antwerp, Amsterdam and, and London. Um, the Bill of Exchange is a form of deferred payment between merchants trading across distant locations. Um, and although it was introduced as a credit instrument in Northern Europe by Italian merchants, the practice had a long antecedence in the Indian Ocean uh, in the form of the Suftaja or indeed uh, again, speaking of, of uh, the Horn of Africa, um, the Hawala, or indeed the, the, the this is one of my favorites, apparently it's not true, it's a shame, but the, the uh, institution of the Czech, which apparently uh, was the precursor to the contemporary Czech. Um, so the crucial innovation here in this early modern use of bills of exchange is that there was an increasingly limitless capacity to circulate across different markets, not just the one-off transaction between merchants, um, but the protracted reciprocal iteration of that exchange, acquiring, uh, allowing these bills of exchange to acquire an abstract quality of a store of universal value. By the mid-16th mid century, the emerging European ports like Antwerp, Amsterdam and London were thus inserted into, in, inserted into a lattice of intercontinental commodity exchange, where again spaces like the Hanseatic Contour or the Mediterranean uh, Fonduk uh, or the Kothi of the Eastern Indian Ocean, all of them double up as warehouses, uh, lodgings of the universal figure of the commercial agent, of the factor in, in the European language, or the Wakil al Tujar in the Arabic, or the Bapari or the Shahbanda, uh, harbour master of, of the Indian Ocean. And I'm not uh, trying to practice my various languages, but it's just by way of illustration, illustrating how these circuits are integrated across various oceans. In fact, on the, uh, if you indulge me on this sem uh, semantic or uh, um, etymological trip, um, interesting, I think many English words like magazine or traffic, tariff, or romance languages like aduana or avais derive from Arabic and Persian, reflecting again this westward journey from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea uh, and beyond. So what um, we're trying to say, and I'll start to uh, wind up, is that um, the specifically early modern European commercial practices that crystallized profit, proselytism, and power in the shape of the chartered companies that Liam was talking about um, are the antecedents to the kind of high-risk area. And perhaps the most uh, signal example of this is the market in insurance that underwrote not just the, um, the process of circulation of the bills of exchange that I've been talking about, but of course the processes of, of, of primitive accumulation. The, the uh, confluence of services, of, of risk, of credit, of insurance, of intelligence, the, uh, the emergence of, uh, of newspapers, Lloyd's List or the uh, Courant in, in, in Antwerp and, and Amsterdam, are reflections of this um, this confluence of, of this functional confluence of services that are the product not just of spatial concentration but also the fact that traders um, start to double up as bookkeepers and currency exchange and interest calculators um, and combine that kind of access to information with their commercial acumen. 
And here the sea, uh, as we were saying earlier, also plays, uh, has a, a certain agency um, insofar as the sea with its changing tidal ranges, with its uh, uh, changing form, forms in, 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 in natural harbors, the freezing, the weather, and so on and so forth, becomes itself a domain of risk calculus. And it's out of that terrakeous combination of, on the one hand, accumulating capital, be it in Antwerp and Amsterdam or London, and on the other hand, the sea as a space of opportunity, but also risk, that, um, that the kinds of insurance uh, outfits like Lloyd's emerge. So in sum, throughout the long 16th century, credit and insurance practices that had first reappeared in Europe throughout the medieval traffic gradually migrated northern to the northern ports like Antwerp, Amsterdam, and London. And this staggering increase in the accumulated wealth uh, in those countries was also, in those cities rather, was also accompanied and to a degree facilitated by the structural change in the relationship between finance, trade, and government. Um, it's also represented uh, anecdotally, but I think very interestingly, in the beginnings of a, a, a sea or a maritime imaginary in the writings in English language of Jonathan Swift and Daniel Defoe, who, uh, who apply similar tropes of seaborne risk and adventure in the subsequent uh, creations. So I hope that this gives you again a picture combining the flag of convenience and of uh, the exclusive economic zone that addresses the question, where does authority lie in the oceans? And part of uh, our answer is that the authority in the oceans lies in those entities, many of them public-private, many of them hybrid, that are able to define, produce the spaces of high-risk areas, of zones. So just in summary, what we've tried to do is explore uh, three questions. Uh, the first one is, who owns the fish? How is exploitation organized at sea, and where does authority lie on the ocean? Uh, we propose the kind of conceptual way in, we think, spatially linking sovereignty, ter ter territory, and accumulation. Um, and there's obviously it's a necessarily sketchy series of case studies across time and places. You know. um, what we hope to have done is to illustrate the role of the sea as a powerful site of capitalist conflict and reproduction, and to highlight the maritime factor in capitalist development. We made two main arguments, just to reiterate them. The first one is that the sea is a site and source of competitive innovation and experimentation by capital, in part because of the specific biophysical challenges it poses. And secondly, that responses to these challenges have historically produced uniquely terraqueous spaces, including those of political solidarity and contestation. So we hope that we've piqued your interest in this, in this forgotten space. And uh, thanks, I'll move over to Ron, I think, or the chair. Thank you, thank you very much to both of you. That was fascinating. Juan, would you like to take five minutes to offer some reflections? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Just to like, open the discussion, a few, um, a few things and, and questions as well. Um, let me say that it's, of course, a pleasure to be here and to I don't know why I accept it here, but anyway, that's another question. But, but it's a pleasure to, to see Marx's political economy against, like, as, an, as a good antidote against many mystifications and fictitious narratives of what's the sea. And reclaiming a territory, I think it's quite, uh, it's, it's quite important as you, you show, even though you have only a few samples, I think it's quite an interesting research agenda. So um, I, I got... Uh, I would say that against the idea that uh, the sea is, uh, if you allow me, no man's land, you show quite clearly that, that, that there are two, that, that the process of valorization is going on uh, at the sea. So capitalism is extracting um, different natural resources by fishing, but also by something you didn't mention, but it's quite important nowadays, which is deep sea mining. And so uh, oil, uh, offshore oil will be there. And the second one is, of course, another key thing in the process of valorization, which has been there since the beginning of times, which is transport. So um, that's the first kind of uh, way of regaining, uh, of showing again that capitalism is key in understanding the sea. Uh, the second one is the importance of the state. So in st state investment in the sea, navigation, dredging, um, lighthouses, uh, counter piracy, the whole, uh, the whole public 
uh, investment and we will get to the problem of the state, which state is there. So I, I think that you managed quite convincingly to, to show, to transcend this land sea binary that, that's, uh, I would say it's in the naive interpretation, the naive reading of, of what's the sea for capitalism, what's the sea for us today. Um, and in this way, you, you, you do way more than understand something about the sea. I think you do uh, something which is important, which is you illuminate, uh, again, the question by, by, by looking at the specific case, you illuminate lots of questions on the problem of space territory and uh, the state, which is, I think, uh, interesting as well. So um, I would say there are so one, uh, one important uh, historical role of the sea that you recover and, and, and we, should, we should maybe discuss. One is the one you mentioned about, the, about finance and, and the social form of risk, how it's been shaped after the sea. But I think you end up in a other risk. I will get to that now. Uh, and the second one is, is how uh, one you didn't mention, but how the axis of the Mediterranean has changed to the Atlantic all through the development of capitalism. So the importance of Italy, uh, Turkey, and the Arab world uh, changed to uh, places such as this island and uh, the Atlantic. But we, we, we can we can discuss that later on. How, how that's been uh, kind kind of went hand in hand with the development of capitalism. But let me get to two problems I think we, we, we could uh, discuss today. So I would say, th there are, I'm not saying you, uh, you are getting this too wrong, but rather that there, are, there is a risk of misunderstanding what you're doing in two specific ways. So one is um, when you get to what's so specific about the sea. So you show quite quickly that there is no such a land sea binary. But then what's left about the sea that's not that's different from the from land? And I think there you have a risk of romanticizing land, which is you 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 show suppose the idea that you have uh, when I try to understand where you, you try to see the sea as something different. Um, I had was just just said today that sea has an agency and has tides and has risk. I think you can also, if you do agriculture, you will know about uh, rains and different like climatological problems, and and so you would say also that nature has an agency. Uh, you also sp speak of biophysical challenges or obstacles sometimes, while the sea has both. And 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 if you if you th if you look at land and um, shingles and and deserts, you will also find that, that, that it's also problematic and, and land is not always so homogeneous and so stable as, as it looks. So I will challenge you to see why you think some geographical features of, this, of the sea as a space, so geographically or, or biophysically defined, are different or substantially different from, or uh, yeah, intrinsically different from land. Um, so that, that's, what, that's where I would say this is the risk of romanticizing uh, land. The second one is, I would say, a bit more controversial, but it's the risk of romanticizing the national state. And it's in the solutions you find to the problem of territorialization. And uh, I think the, the sea is different. And, uh, and the sea shows how there is no, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable to find a patchwork of different national states claiming uh, the territoriality to specific patches of, of the sea. But then you, all through your exposition, you don't seem to challenge that, but rather try to accommodate the model to that, which with the idea of exclusive economic zones, or even with the idea of um, the flag of convenience. I think, uh, the, the, because what's, what I, I, I understand that this is pointing towards is to the limits of the proper, uh, the limits of the uh, nation state territorialization of different places. So, uh, Maybe we can we can talk a bit about that. You understand that there are, there are novel issues of governance, but also when when you when you get to the details, sometimes you have state investment. Sometimes you have private companies actually being the on, the only ones who rule there. Is you have uh, also international um, international organizations such as the ILO or, or the World Bank, uh, basically being the, the the rulers. Sometimes basically the American state, as as usual being the overpower. So I think there, is also, there are also limits to the problem of uh, the national state as 
when, when you look at, it, at how, how it tried to territorialize uh, the sea, and this also brings me to a question about resistance, which is when you look at workers in, 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 uh, in, in FOC ships, well, whether they, their strategies has been, have been always trying to get to belong to a better state or rather others. And I think by looking at resistance there, we will also learn a bit more about these uh, limits of, this, uh, of the national state, as I'm understanding. So, uh, again, I think it's been a great and really challenging uh, idea to reclaim the, 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 the role of the sea in the development of capitalism and ensuring that we should also try to, and challenging us our ideas of space and territorialization, I think it will be uh, great to see the book finish soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to take a few moments to respond or should we open straight to the floor? Yeah, okay, well. Okay, anybody like to ask a question? Raise your hands, wave at me. Uh, yep, in the back there. Yeah, um, yeah very interesting. I'm, I'm particularly I'm interested in the history of it, but even let's leave aside the history of it. Look at the situation. And Alex posed the, the point about the issue of counter piracy, suggesting that private shipping plays a critical role. Thanks. Thank you. So. Let me let me have a go first, uh, Lima. Uh, the the question about what's distinctive about the sea, and then pick up these. What's distinctive about the sea is that it cannot be occupied, and I think that's that's critical. Um, I take your point absolutely that there's a danger of bending the stick too far the other way. Of course, there are many parts of uh, the world's landmass that present all kinds of challenges to governance. But one way historically, um, especially, not uniquely, but especially under industrial capitalism, is to settle those lands, to get you know, your settlers um, to, to occupy that land, to police it, and critically, if you're capitalist, to improve it. I think there's, as Liam was saying, there's a, a, a capitalist dynamic to, there's similar capitalist dynamics at sea through improvement technological improvement, fish gathering devices, and so on and so forth. Uh, Liam can talk about that. Um, but they're not premised on occupation of the sea. They're premised on rents, uh, ex ex license to fish in the exclusive economic zones. So the juridical form is not one of sovereign control or attempt at sovereign control, as might be the case on land. It's one of appropriation and of uh, rent extraction, um, commodity extraction through the figure of the um, of, of property rights. So that would be my starting point. Now I, I, I appreciate, or I want to add that um, that that is a framework, which then obviously, if it has any purchase, can be applied in different contexts in different ways. And there's uh, all kinds, I'm sure, all kinds of weird and wonderful. 
uh, very uh, cont phenomena similar to the one I've been describing about uh, the way the, 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 the marine resources are appropriated on land. And I think mining is one of the areas that we've been looking at, that there's some parallels. And this is more, more than us making the argument here. It's more an invitation to hear whether that analogy uh, works, whether that comparison works. But the the fishing vessel, the factory ship, the total institution that Liam was talking about at sea has many parallels with the remote mining uh, total institutions uh, where life world and the workplace are combined, uh, where there's uh, ethnic segmentation, stratification, the forms of domination to reproduce. So I think there's, there's leeway for that, but I would, uh, again, go back to what is really unique about the sea, I mean, to put it somewhat bluntly, is nobody lives at sea. We live, uh, civilizations, peoples have lived in coastal areas and we lived off from the sea, off the sea, um, lived in islands. But the idea of seasteading, for instance, is one of those sort of neoliberal utopias, this idea that you can actually reproduce societies at sea. Um, so I, I'd, I'd emphasize occupation and linking occupation to, to improvement. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting question as well. I don't have the wherewithal to provide you a detailed anatomy of what is a very complex complex of shippers, of lease, of container leases, of, um, uh, of uh, shipping firms, transport firms, uh, operators, and so on and so forth. But with regard to the example of the high-risk area off the coast of Somalia, it is bodies like an outfit called BIMCO. Does anybody know of BIMCO? Have you heard of BIMCO? Norvai, really, until one begins to investigate. And this is um, an outfit set up in 1905 called the Baltic and International Maritime Council, incorporating some of the big players in the shipping world, container world, ship owners, uh, you know, from Hapag Lloyd right through to, um, uh, you know, the, the, some of the uh, masks and so on and so forth. Um, but these are bodies tellingly, uh, to my mind anyhow, forged in moments of sort of, um, of, of liberal valorization of the sea around the turn of the, of the 19th century. Um, that are explicitly about mobilizing these maritime interests. And they were responsible for retrenching or revising the high-risk area. It's that body that has defined that high-risk area. In the case of the original um, high-risk area and the international uh, recommended transit corridor, uh, just up there on the Gulf of Aden proper, there's various moments, and I don't want to elaborate too much, but it started out, the, 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 the counter-piracy operations are NATO and EU-led. Uh, um, Operation Atalanta is the, is the dominant one, and it has had various renewed mandates. But it started off as a UN-mandated World Food Programme um, initiative or campaign to allow World Food Programme vessels to provide emergency aid, allegedly, to Somalia. And a UN Council, UN Security Council resolution 1816 allows for the counter piracy in Somali coastal waters. From that initial multilateral attempt at relief, by 2008, through again a multilateral body, this, this um, I mean, I'd refer you to this best management pra um, practices for protection against Somali based piracy, BMP4. Really interesting. I don't normally say this about these kinds of documents, but really interesting because, again, it involves classic global governance language of stakeholders, of public private partnerships, of multilateral agencies. So the UN specialized agencies are involved, the private shipping companies are involved, uh, the uh, International Maritime Office is involved. Um, which in, in, in effect is a, um, a branch of the international, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the commercial, what are they called? Chambers of Commerce outfit. So uh, it's a roundabout answer, which I think boils down to that it's complicated, but in a way it's deliberately complicated because the whole point is that the sea is a domain where these kinds of these kinds of governance can be experimented precisely because they are nobody's 
property because they are the high seas. There is uh, a body of law, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, and suppression of unlawful acts at sea, but it's mediated through these uh, governance institutions. Um, the uh, the Bab al-Mandab and the, sorry, no, the, the Straits of Hormuz, um, of course, they're critical choke points, together with the Malacca Straits, with the Suez Canal, with Panama Straits. And now, interestingly, um, the Northern Passage along the Russian coastline, Arctic coastline, and the Northwest Passage uh, uh, across Canada. They, these, these zones, these uh, parts of the world in, in, in the Arctic uh, areas that are, are turning from ice to sea are being valorized and they're being securitized and they are being charged with diplomatic force. You know, uh, s suddenly India, People's Republic of China want to have observer status in the Arctic Council. What's that about? Well, it's about uh, a potential route, uh, at least a summer route, potentially a year-long route in the next decades that would, um, most accounts, slash the route from, say, Shenzhen to, uh, to Felix, though, by about a third. You know, that's a significant saving. It's also about the, the kinds of energy sources that you're that you're referring to um juan um you know mineral extraction on the on the on the seabed um it's also about nato and its geopolitical increasingly uh increasing tension with 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 russia with you know nato countries like the united states norway canada uh now sharing waters with 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 the arctic so the banal answer, sorry if it, it sounds too banal, is that it's complicated. Um, and I guess what we're trying to bring to the table is that, A, it's complicated for a reason, namely that there is, that the sea is a domain that facilitates, not, again, mechanically or automatically, but facilitates this overlapping idea of governance. And also because, and this is my insistence perhaps more than Liam's, although I think we're kind of converging on, on that there are certain biophysical properties to the sea. Um, it goes back to it cannot be occupied or it cannot be improved in ways that land might be. Sorry. I just want to add very quickly the major difference between the sea and the land is that the, the sea as yet has not been able to be changed by human beings. It is now, <laughs> but not as, a deliberate, as an unintended consequence of capitalist development, but it's just not the same types of ability to mould the environment within which human beings live. Um, of course, been, you know, ocean acidification, you know, global warming, dead zones, and so on. That's changing, but that's a, a slightly different kind of dynamic, I think. I also wanted to get at your second point a little bit more, which was about the risk of romanticizing the nation state and what of resistance. And are, we, are you suggesting that if there weren't non flags, if flags of convenience didn't exist, there'd be the same problem anyway? Is that kind of what you're getting at? No worries. No, no. Okay. Because I mean, what the flag of convenience allows capital to do is to bypass law and buy a law according to which law suits it, and the various flagging nations are able to kind of you know, race to the bottom. Actually, technically, the race to the bottom isn't the case when it comes to environmental regulation on boats, uh, and when it comes to occupational health and safety on boats. Actually, there's a kind of race to the middle. Right on labor standards, there's a race to the bottom. And I think that that's crucial in understanding why it is that flags of convenience are being used in the way that they're being used. And um, uh, yeah. one other quick thing that's worth mentioning is the question of appropriation and mining in the seabed is that, that as yet, that's not the case in what's called the area or the common heritage of humankind. But that's what's going to be changing <laughs> next. That's kind of on the agenda. So if there are a couple of big multinational firms who are working with very small, easily manipulated uh, island states to make a case that they should have the right to dig in the so-called common heritage of humankind. And that's the kind of the new frontier, let's say, of, uh, of uh, appropriation from the sea. Because at the moment, you can only do that legally on the continental shelf, but not in the really the deep sea. Thank you. Any, any more hands? Thank you. 
Thank you. Shreya? Can I have a first go? Liam, or do you want to? I'll do the historical one. The periodization. Okay. Um, I think it's a, it's a good example of uh, reclamation, of sea reclamation. But the in terms of international law, that, um, that claim, if you're talking about the Spratlys and other kind of islands in, in the South China Sea, are reliant on land being... Uh, visible or being above the low tide, even if it's two and a half meters, you know, which is sometimes the range. So we're still talking about uh, the need to then claim the 200 nautical miles from a piece of land that is above sea. So, you know, I, I take your point that the, um, that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and as Liam was saying, even before that, the Truman Declaration and having the geopolitical power allows the territorialization of the sea and, and indeed the enclosure, uh, a word that we haven't used yet, but, you know, the map that Liam was showing earlier, I mean, this is, this is enclosure, there's no doubt about it. But there are still some parts of the high seas that cannot be claimed because there's no land around uh, above sea level, so I, you know, I know it probably sounds like a um, a cruelly materialist point, but that's that's the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there there is. A, a historic, as, as you know, a historic sort of dispute amongst various states, Vietnam, People's Republic, Philippines, and so on and so forth. What I found quite interesting in this is that the, the People's Republic is using the famous nine dash line that is actually a Taiwanese uh, map or, you know, a, a Republic of China map. So, um, so Beijing is using uh, um, a, a claim that effectively Taiwan has as well, uh, and you know you get these these ironies uh, again, where the French apparently um, still claim have a claim on the Spratlys, uh, yeah, uh, because of their colonial legacies, and, uh, and 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 so you you know there's there's very much. Um, an imperial colonial reading, contemporary colonial imperial reading of, of, of that dispute as, as a legacy of, um, yeah, of, of imperialism in Southeast Asia that in some respects continues. But I guess the, the main point is that the, the, the spatial representation of that, the, the way in which it's um, represented and presented in bodies like the Commission on the, uh, the, the Limits of Continental Shelf, um, is one that is presented as being multilateral and distinctive to uh, to that regime of, of the UN Convention of the Sea on, on UNCLOS. Can I just add just something very quickly on that? So from China's perspective, the, the whole law of the sea reflects what they would argue would be the confetti of empire, which is these various overseas territories, overseas countries and territories of you know, Britain and France and the United States and others, which allowed them to claim large chunks of the sea. And you compare the volume of the Chinese EZ on a per capita basis, it's tiny. So that's kind of their kind of self-justification for this, the, the history of imperialism. 
Um, but what I wanted to talk about briefly was uh, Shreya's really good question about historical periodization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we're doing here is just a taster of, you know, a book and ch various chapters. And the way we've tried to address this thorny problem of how do you even historicize the, because we focus, focus primarily on historical capitalism, we're not really doing an abstract analysis of, you know, um, how do you historicize something as, you know, 400, 500 years of, of history? Re the way we've periodized is according to themes. So, for example, one of the themes I was talking about on exploitation or labor regimes there, the focus very much is on the British merchant marine and the relationship with empire. So that's the very much the, kind of the focus there. But then we kind of shift to post-World War II, flag of convenience and the changing kind of global shipping, completely different types of crews. For example, Philippine crew being one of the crucial kind of, uh, uh, kind of labor outsourcing strategy of the Philippine state. So it, yeah, in the book, <laughs> it will be much more focused on specific periods. Um, but obviously, this is a, yeah, a snapshot. Um, yeah, so the, the main point that I wanted to make is that we are developing different periods according to the different themes. So on exploitation, there will be a, a principal uh, periodization around the British Empire in post World War II kind of context. But on something like appropriation, uh, there is the, the long history of uh, and, uh, the development of capitalist fishing, but you know, it's kind of really picked up after World War II and the industrialization of fishing on a global scale, and that allows you to then pick pick out particular moments. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but a little bit maybe. Alex, no, I mean, just, just to reinforce that that it's a it's a big question. We don't really have we're not there yet. I think, um, and the I think the interesting thing is that there's multiple. I mean, just to reiterate what Liam's saying, that there's multiple temporalities. So if you look at international law, there's a sort of Grotian moment of uh, the first the, thinking about the law of the sea. Uh, if you think about the organization of labor, it has a different, uh, there's a different sort of periodization. I guess what we will probably try and do is emphasize those moments of overlap. Um, it's, it's, it's not a functional overlap, uh, but there is, I think, a structural relationship, for instance, to take the example of, of uh, the law of the sea, between Grotius's musings on, on the law of the sea and his defense of the freedom of the sea and the expansion of northwest mercantilist empires. It, it's just, it, it's obvious, actually, at one level. Um, that doesn't mean that it pans out smoothly. Clearly, there's, there's, there's forms of contestation. But it's remarkable that, you know, Grotius explicitly is, um, is contracted by the East India Company to say, to, to, to warrant um, a Dutch encroachment on the, on, on the Spice Islands to get the Portuguese out of the way. And that moment of overlap of uh, mercantilist or commercial capitalism on the one hand and the beginnings of a certain conception of the three seas, um, I think would be one one concentration. I think we're going to be never. To, well, let's see. Um, but the Brodel, the Brodelian con conceptions of of multiple uh, temporalities that sometimes overlap will probably play some role there because there's no tidy beginning or end. Thank you. Um, any final questions?
biophysical elements. You, you, uh, as I mentioned, you said occupation was the main thing. But you have the nice diagram there of the so the fact that fish move or the, kind of the quality moves around and reproduces itself, what uh, or not? Uh, what does that does that play any role in? So what? How yeah, the, how, yeah. how, what does that do in terms of dynamics? Yeah, sure. yeah, something to that, which is, um, which is, I think, on the point of occupation, which is one interesting. I, I think one could argue that um, there is some mythology of the land, of the territory, in every single national state, where they, the the Actually, the sea is more occupied than the large chunks or pieces of land. So, so suppose you can't occupy the Sahara Desert, not the Atacama Desert, but Chile won't ever say they don't own the yeah, land, yeah. right? But that's myth purely mythological. I mean, and it's more important the sea in terms of the valorization process than the Atacama Desert. A similar thing could be argued for Amazonas. I know you, you. So, the question of occupation. I understand that you are like getting uh, an old idea of settlement mm -hmm. and 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 the possibility of social reproduction. And but there are lots of spaces where social reproduction is not possible, but still uh, are part of the of fertilization process, which is uh, the point. Uh, here made. But so I, I wouldn't take this at face value, basically that since you can't occup occupy, then there are no, there is no, um, there are no social forces around the regulation and uh, maintenance and, and so on. But that will be only. Are there any more questions from the floor before I hand over? No? Okay. So, um, the first question on the downplaying of the sea versus land comparison. I'm going to skip that because I think I think we kind of talked a little bit about that and focus much more on your point about the extreme impacts on marine life and so on, like whale oil, for example, you know, whale blubber, providing the light of you know Boston and and so on. You know, uh, that's we're writing very much about that and the appropriation of uh, of nature through capitalism in the sea. Um, that's a fundamental kind of one of the chapters that we're writing about. And I talked a little bit about that in relation to fisher fisheries. But one of the things you other kind of uh, intonated was what we're putting into the sea. So and it's not just pollution, it's not just plastic, it's also heat. And the incredible you know, 20 last 25 years of the kind of heat dump the kind of the, the sea has essentially absor absorbed. And eventually, that if, if the, the carbon, the, the, the kind of oceanog oceanographic science is correct, that's going to start getting to its kind of absolute limits. And that what we now know about greenhouse kind of gas global warming is going to become ex uh, accelerated precisely because of the heating of the sea. So, I think that's a fundamental aspect of what we're doing, but just not what we're talking about today, um, because we're just trying to talk about very specific, narrow. Uh, points, even though, of course, we're also running through hundreds of years of history. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, so our apologies for missing that point, but you know, it's certainly there. On the question of occupation, I think that this is leading us into a little bit of a red herring because um, uh, the sea can be occupied in certain ways. So, for example, if you look, I was just the other day, I was in the Solomon Islands and I was in the uh, regional surveillance centre and they have this map on the wall, but it's real time. And they're mapping every single boat that's in the sea. And you'll actually see the boats fishing exactly, exactly on the line using GPS. So the, the, the line of the, the EEZ, even though it's a man-made line, it doesn't actually exist as a border, there is a kind of form of kind of occupation there in the sense that it's kind of observed, regulated, and governed. And then the question is, you know, to what extent does that matter anyway? Well, it does matter to the extent that those states are able to <laughs> appropriate uh, 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 rents from 
uh, that activity of those fishing fleets. So when they're fishing in so inshore, they can capture a portion of the surplus value from that activity. When they're not in their waters, they can't. And that's exactly why tuna, I mean, that's why I'm so fascinated by tuna, because they, you know, they swim around these entire areas. And you can see here this kind of huge millions of miles that, 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 that tuna swim, and it creates a very peculiar and difficult problem for capital, one, to try and catch, but also, too, then for the state to try and, and regulate. And it's exactly that kind of no person's land of the high seas, which, which makes it kind of interesting, let's say, but also potentially more environmentally destructive because it's impossible to regulate. I mean, Liam's, as you, some of you know, is is uh, is the man on tuna. Uh, so I'm not going <laughs> to, um, Mr. Tuna UK. Um, but just so, just to riff a bit on, on that. I think uh, for me, what is what is to address your question? What is challenging about the tuna is that it's a movement, and that I think does condition how capital can then appropriate that potential commodity. Um, I mean, again, I'll defer to, to Liam. What I find quite interesting is that experiments in tuna ranching, for instance, of enclosing, uh, are unsuccessful amongst other reasons because of the because of the very nature of these of these highly migratory species. So apparently, it costs more to fatten those penned in tuna, those ranch tuna. Um, they reproduce uh, less. Um, so the mobility is the value. <laughs> But in order to capture that value, you need an infrastructure that has to be in movement as well. And um, I suppose at the end, although technology and, um, and labor regimes that Liam's been talking about might allow the, um, the extension of, of, of the ship at sea, so the factory ships are, might be out at sea longer, um, at some stage they've got to return to land. And they are... In, in some respects, they never leave land while they're at sea. Uh, and I think that is distinctive. I think that is distinctive. I mean, I take your point that sovereignty is a legal fiction, but boy, does it have an infrastructure that reinforces, you know, the, uh, if, 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 if there is an incursion uh, of, I don't know, Venezuelan... Uh, um, supported agents into Colombian in the Colombian uh, part of the Amazon, uh, then, you know, those countries will will do something about it. Uh, you know, there'll be a diplomatic incident. That doesn't happen in the high seas because it's nobody's property, or at least not not in that particular form. Um, that would be my, my point. Um, I mean, I, th I take your points, and as Liam said, I think, I hope that we don't um, we don't down, downplay the land sea division. In, in fact, in a way, I think that our, our challenge is not to overplay it in ways that uh, one has, has suggested. Um, and logistics will play a central role inevitably in the book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to, to logistics, not least because, as some of you will know, the, the first, the, the, the guy who, um, in effect, universalized the container as we know it today, um, a guy called Malcolm McLaren. Uh, not the punk uh, empresario, um, called his outfit Sea Land Services. You know, he, he wanted trucks on ships. He wanted uh, trucks that go on water, and he got them. They're called containers. Um, one of the themes, I know Liam um, doesn't like me saying this, but I, I sense we're almost closing, so it might be for the sort of post-match discussions, but um, is that there is a process of, or there are elements of the sea washing back onto land, uh, a sort of maritimization of land through, for instance, coastal, coastal export processing zones. And I think the, the container is a key element of that um, because the container is not simply a freight technology. It is a social force. It's, it's a political artifact that carries with it all kinds of very powerful social relations, uh, you know, I'm talking about the fact that it's universal, that it's standardized, that it's mechanized, and that, um, well, Liam knows far better than I do, who's you know, working in the School of Management, that has real implications for the way in which uh, labor is organized in these special economic zones. But note, for me, the critical thing is that, again, there's a zonal dynamic here in terms of spaces. The, the zone is, is something that is, is kind of exceptional. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a... It, it's a legal fiction, but if you're working in that zone, you know that that 
fiction actually applies quite seriously on your terms and conditions, on your life world, on your relationship between um, between the, the, the workplace and, and the life world. And I, uh, you know, this is something that we're still thinking about. Um, I'm not suggesting that the sea is the origin of the exporting processing zones alone, but it cannot be a coincidence that a disproportionate number of these EBZs are coastal, that they're precisely the uh, spaces where land meets sea. Oh, yeah, okay. We've got another question. Yeah, 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 we've got time, yeah. <laughs> Do the last one, you do the first yeah. <laughs> Just to check if there's anyone else with a question, now would be the perfect time. We'll have to look that one up. Yeah, yeah. It was so funny, I couldn't really yeah, yeah. wonder if I was my chest was hurting from doing that. Yeah. <laughs> it was really nice. Oh, oh, come on. Yeah, just briefly, I know we're nearing the end here, but it's really to push on from the issue that we have with periodization. <laughs> anyway, but um, if you're talking about capital, I mean, different model. How it was yeah. 
Um, can I just try and address the um, question of does historical materialism prioritise anthropocentric prior, uh, thinking about the sea? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the reason why we've prioritised, I think, uh, the extraction of particular fish, for example, is because that's the ones that capital has been prioritising. And it, despite that, it also has very considerable unintended consequences for multiplicity of other species, like bycatch and, and, and so on. Um, so that, that's part of the story, not the story we were talking about today, but I, I think it would be wrong to just talk about the, the commercial stocks and not look at the kind of the entire ecosystem within which they exist. Because if you take out certain species, it has a negative effect elsewhere. So you talked earlier about the cod kind of collapse. I mean, that had a very positive impact on the shrimp population, <laughs> which you know are now a bountiful kind of product of that ocean, the canal for Canada. You know, so I think that I don't think that historical materialism of necessity has to prioritise the capital-centric kind of species. But I think in terms of trying to study what capitalism is and what it does, that's the first step, I would argue. And then from there, you have to also look at the, the wider dynamics. Unless, of course, you're coming from an actor network kind of theory or, and, and you're trying to suggest that the various positionalities of the various things are of equal relevance, which is, would be a different kind of question, which I won't get into. And on Henry's point, um, there are many competing periodization. One, what we were trying to do today was pick particular moments and show the difference. So, for example, the labour regime on the British merchant marine in the 1700s compared to the labour regimes on boats under flag of convenience vessels, which is both of which aren't the only labour regimes on boats in both of those eras, but they're both the dominant ones in both eras. So that's the way we've kind of tried to slice up that pie, um, just as an example. So I think that's a, exactly what it is that we're trying to do. Um, I think, but maybe not as well thought through or precise as we would like to be yet. Yeah, so again, quickly, um, or as, as briefly as possible, because these are really good and, and big questions. Um, the ontology, I mean, you know, that word always <laughs> scary in a way. I, I think we're, we're emphatically not saying that there is, that capitalism is the only order that has this terrakeous territoriality. I'm, um, Surprised nobody's picked up on, on our use of the terrakeus and whether we, we should or not. But anyhow, that's another issue. Um, of course, all kinds of human cultures, civilizations, social formations across time and place have had to negotiate the relationship between land and sea. But we are making a claim from a historical materialist perspective that there's a certain specificity to that relationship. And it's, it is, it is um, one where... Capital tries, as you know, Monsieur Le Capital, to capture uh, sea resources, to valorize them, oftentimes in ways that it might do on land. And yet, our story, our proposition, is that there's constant limits to that. There's constant um, biophysical limitations to that. And, you know, capital in different contexts innovates, responds to that by, for instance, saying, okay, we can't, we can't uh, enclose the sea. There are no fences in the sea, right? Um, but what we can do is experiment with a juridical form that allows the exploitation of resources, 200 nautical miles, as property, whilst recognizing that there's freedom of nav navigation. So there's a classic sort of separation of the, of the political and the economic. And that is historically distinctive. You know, Polynesian society, I mean, uh, Phil Steinberg's book is very good, synthesis of this, as you probably know. Um, um, you know, he looks at, at what he calls the Indian Ocean model. He looks at the Mediterranean model uh, of what he called stewardship of the sea. Um, he, uh, the, 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 the Pacific nations, again, this has changed through time, but have a completely different conception of, of the sea and the relationship between land and sea, which you know, is often linked to spiritual burial places, to a, a different cosmology. What we're suggesting is that there's a dominant form of con conceiving of land and sea, which is a, a capitalist one. Now, um, Henry, 
this is this is where it gets uh, uh, dangerous because you know we start uh, stroking each other's egos, or at least we might stroke yours in the sense that on the issue of the origins of capitalism, of course, in the book we have to define the term and put our cards on the table of wh where we where we arrive at this. Um, your point that, for instance, in the um, classic contrast between a sort of uh, Ellen Wood, Brenner, it's agrarian capitalism, stupid, it's about England, and the Wallerstein, uh, Braudel, circulationist, it's all about the sea. It's both. It's not either or, it's both. And what's, I think, quite interesting, this is the chapter on circulation, which I've kind of taken the lead on, is um, and part of the story I tried to tell today is that, you know, that there is no... Um, the city of London and its hinterlands are integrated and Amsterdam and Antwerp are integrated into these pre-existing pre-capitalist networks and they're valorized in particular form in, in we have to be quite conjunctural about it. Look at the specific ways in which that, that happens. I attempt, we, we attempt to do that in the book and uh, the first version on circulation. But the, the story or, or the, the where we've reached is a view that it's, it's not either or. Um, there is a, a strong relationship between accumulation of capital in the English countryside and the circulation or kind of value um, overseas. Absolutely. Just to add to that, just super quickly, sorry, do you mind? <laughs> I mean, you know, people don't often talk about maritime industries, mar maritime industries in the transition to capitalism in, in, in England. Everyone talks about kind of agriculture and, and then clothing and textiles. But it was the third largest employer in, 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 in Britain. You know, from the, from the 1700s and, and throughout it. You know, it's a huge, huge industry with lots of lots of ancillary industries producing its own kind of like motions of capitalist innovation and development. And I just think that, you know, there's something there as well, although we haven't nailed it exactly yet. Sorry. No, no, that's excellent. So we have lots of uh, food for discussion. We'd like to invite you all very warmly to join us for a reception after the seminar. So we're going to have some wine and some nibbles and keep talking about these issues. Uh, that's going to be right now in the senior common room in the main building uh, on the first floor. If you don't know the way, wait around for me and I can show you. Uh, and next week we have a special panel event that we'd like to invite you all to. Development in crisis, states, conflict, refugees, celebrating 25 years of development studies here at SOAS. Uh, so I hope to see you there and hope to see you at the reception. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you to our speakers, Liam, Alex, and Tawan.